Hi folks, welcome to Genus Homo. Today we're going to talk about early Genus Homo. So now we're delving into the blue individuals in our chart here. Specifically, we're going to be concentrating on this one. This is Homo habilis. Homo habilis is usually recognized as the first genus Homo. Uh, it laid down a lot of ground rules for which other genus Homo are supposed to follow. So we're going to talk about what those ground rules are and the fact that not all of them hold up, which we'll meet later on with another of uh, genus Homo. All right, let's get started. Fundamentally, the biggest thing that uh, isolates the genus away from the earlier gen geni like uh, Australopithecus is the size of their brains. All of a sudden, the brain size jumps really large in capacity. You can see it's over 650 cc's. That is nearly double what was going on in Australopithecus. Their stature gets a little taller, their legs get a little longer. These things are following what we were associating with those temporal traits that we talked about before. Remember, the temporal traits, we become more and more bipedal. Our brains get larger and larger. And the last thing is our teeth get smaller and smaller. And sure enough, you can see that. We've got larger brains, taller stature, which, and shorter arms, which goes along with the long legs. This all fits in with walking long distance walking, and probably to some extent jogging. The manipulative hands has something to do with what ultimately becomes the bigger brains in a minute, which, and also the smaller canine teeth, which we'll talk about at length and what that all means in just a few minutes. Okay, welcome to genus Homo. This is Homo habilis. This is the first one, the type specimen. Her nickname was Twiggy based on a model. She was, I think, the world's first supermodel, this woman Twiggy. I'm not sure what her name implied other than the fact that she was extremely skinny. And I'm not sure why the Leakies named this one Twiggy. Was it a tip of the hat appreciation? Like, oh, hey, we're going to nickname her Twiggy. Or was it making fun of the supermodel for being so skinny? Because here you have a skeletal, I don't know. I don't know what the difference is or why they named it Twiggy, but her nickname is Twiggy. Twiggy is usually associated with two other skulls, which are really commonly associated with Homo habilis, although they do have different names in some charts. I mentioned lumpers versus splitters earlier. I am considered a lumper for sure. Um, there are others who are like Ian Tattersall, who would be a splitter. They believe that each one of these little things should be a different species. I disagree with that. I think that the data shows us that they should be lumped together and it, it, these differences are just showing individual characteristics. Remember, these are each individuals. Each of these fossils is an individual. So what we're looking at could be just simply variation within the species, which makes more sense if we consider the Darwin principle of if they're doing the same thing at the same time in the same place, one of them is going to die out. Well, we don't see this very quickly with Havilis along with most of the other things. Let's look at the other Havilines. This is Twiggy's little sister. Um, her real name is KNM ER 1813, and she was never specifically designated as Homo habilis. In fact, she was never designated as anything. You don't have to know her as, Gina, as 1813. Keep in mind, I'm a, I'm a lumper, so I would consider her Homo habilis. Most people do. One of the key elements of Homo habilis is here. If you look, she's got a big forehead. This doesn't exist. All this extra brain meat up here doesn't even exist in most Australopithecines. You see, from their brow ridge back is pretty much a straight line. It's going just like that. All of this is extra. She also has a much wider base down here of brain matter, and it becomes wider up top as well. So really what's happening with all of the Homo habilines is that they all have really big brains for the size of their bodies, especially compared to Australopithecus. Australopiths were much smaller brain, but otherwise their bodies are just about the same size as Homo habilis. 
Homo habilis, some of which are a little taller. The first one that we met, which is OH24, that is the one who's known as Twiggy, is she stood maybe about three and a half to four feet tall. Still not very tall. This one was probably closer to three foot, which is about the same height as most of the Australopiths. Then the big brother. This one is sometimes attributed to, this is KNM ER 1470. This one is sometimes attributed to a different species name, which is Homo rudolfensis, so named for Lake Victoria, which was used to be called Lake Rudolph. Rudolfensis is a big male. Now, what we might be looking at, in fact, compared to Twiggy, the first one, and 1470 here, and 1813 in between, is males were much larger than the females. That could be the case. Or that this was just a big guy. Either way, most of the rest of us, who are generally lumpers, tend to think this big brain area, and his brain is huge. I'll show you a side view in just a second. You can see how much larger his brain was than any of the Australopiths, and in fact, most of the Homo habilis that we find. He's the big one. Look at this brain size. This is 1470 from the side. Big male, big brain, big face. He's a big guy. We can assume this one probably stood toward the higher end of four and a half feet tall, maybe well, close to five foot, which we would regard as relatively short, certainly for a male in our species, but it's not, it's pretty tall. All things considered, everybody else running around is probably closer to three to four feet. This guy is taller still. So he would be the basketball team in the Homo habilis world. What makes Homo habilis so unique and so amazing and so special is their hand. You can probably guess the hand, the image to the far left, is a hand of a fossil. It is. The hand drawing that we have in the center here is a, an anatomically modern human hand. And the hand that we have over at the far right is an anatomically modern chimpanzee hand. So what do we have? Well, I want to draw your attention to the uh, drawings first. First, let's go all the way over to the right, look at the chimp hand. What do you see? You see very, very long fingers. These are great for grasping and climbing, right? But more importantly, look at the tips of the fingers out here. Out here, you can see these are very narrow. You see, it looks like somebody took this chimp's hand and stuck it in a pencil sharpener and sharpened these tips up. What does that tell us? That tells us they don't use the tips of their fingers by putting pressure on the tips of the fingers all that much. We're talking tip to tip pressure. If you could see a picture of me, I'd be sort of making the OK symbol with my thumb and forefinger, showing you that the tip to tip pressure is very useful. We use it all the time. You and I manipulate objects with our fingertips. Most of the other apes tend to grasp things with a big grasping hand. Their hand is tremendously powerful and made to grasp and climb, but they're not made to do things like threading a needle or writing, drawing, doing things, doing these fine motor skills with the tips of their fingers. Look at the human hand beside it, the one in the middle. Here, you guys can see that these tips expand out. These little expansions, these are called apical tufts. Apical tufts show us that these expansions are being caused by this pressure, this fingertip to fingertip pressure. There's one other thing I want you, well, actually two other things I want you to look at. Number one, the most obvious, look at how short our mid hand is. This is the, the palm region of your hand that I'm indicating with the pointer. This is relatively short, which enables our thumb to be brought up into the range of our fingertips. Now, most of the other, other apes don't require that. They're grasping. So they want more hand to reach around and use this thumb as kind of an anchor point. So they have much longer mid hand and fingers than we do. And then the last thing I want you to pay attention to is down here. 
and that is what's going on in the thumb joint of humans, anatomically modern humans, versus chimpanzees and all the other apes. Well, this is the conundrum of a joint. The more mobile a joint is, like your shoulder, you move all around, it's a very mobile joint, but it's also a very unstable joint, much more likely to become dislocated. But you have all this extra movement. That's a trade-off. Our thumb, if you look at your own hand, you can waggle your thumb. You can hold your fingers straight forward with your thumb on top, and you can rotate your thumb down to toward the middle of your palm. That movement is enabled by the joint at the base of our thumb. It's called a cellar or saddle-shaped joint. The cellar joint or saddle-shaped joint gives our thumb all this extra mobility at the cost of it being less stable. Now, most other primates have a much more stable, powerful thumb joint but they don't have that ability to slide that thumb across. They still have the ability to clamp their thumb together, as we do, but not slide it across. Now, let's bring our attention over to the Homo habilis hand, which is in fossil form in this inset picture. The first thing you're going to see is down here at the base, we do in fact have a cellar joint at the thumb meaning they had that thumb mobility that we have. Plus, look at the end joints of all the fingers that are there. We've got the thumb here, we've got the forefinger and the middle finger, and look, this apical tuft is there, meaning they had a lot of fingertip to fingertip touching. And what that means has to have happened is their fingers, which we can see the finger joints, or the finger bones are very, very short, their hand, their mid-hand, the metacarpals, would be very, very short as well. Therefore, they have what we call manipulative hands. They're able to manipulate small objects. This is huge. What does all this mean? Why is Homo habilis one of our superstars? Fundamentally, it means they were making and using stone tools. So what? You know, probably Australopithecines were using tools, maybe not made out of stone, more than likely made out of things, they call it the osteodendrocarotic uh, toolkit, meaning it was made out of bone, antler, and probably um, wood for their tools. They weren't using stone yet. Well, stone is very, very sharp. Don't know if any of you have tried flint napping, but it is very hard to do. You should take Dr. Falsight's course to do it. But flint napping takes a lot of hand-eye coordination. It's hard to do. It takes a lot of dexterity. It takes a lot of manipulation of the stones. To hit a stone, hit two stones together, and have a piece flake off that is extremely sharp, and pretty tough. You know, if we go out into the wilderness, we like to bring tools with us. Even Bear Grylls cheats. He brings a knife. Well, our ancestors didn't even need to bring a knife. They made them. They made them out of the materials that were around, stone being the first knife. Are they sharp? You bet. You can absolutely shave with stone. In fact, stone is significantly sharper than a razor blade, and we'll talk about that later on, but keep that in mind. Were they using these stone tools, and if so, for what? Well, you guys see these little striations? Do you guys see these marks right through here? This is a bone that has stone tool marks on it. What are they doing? Butchering. Now, are they hunting? Probably not. They're probably uh, going around and finding things. They're lucking out. They're scavenging. They're finding other kills or animals that have just died for one reason or another and taking meat off them. Are they using meat yet? We don't know. We don't know if they're actually eating the meat. More than likely, at this point, they're starting to get into 
some of the higher end foods like legumes, which are beans and nuts. Those sorts of things are what they're starting to get into probably. The meat, they may have delved, delved occasionally into meat. We see, in fact, some primates do that today other than humans. For example, chimpanzees have been known to not only hunt, but also butcher and eat food, meat. But they're very, very cautious about it. They only do it very, very rarely. And when they do it, they don't seem to do it very often. So these guys were probably doing it very occasionally, but those occasions are a big deal. The legumes, the beans and nuts and that sort of thing that they're getting into, the higher quality foods now with the occasional meat is probably what led to their brain expansion at such a dramatic rate. Their brains got very big, very fast. So we're gonna talk a lot about how that affected the subsequent species, which is really probably our greatest superstar yet, which we'll talk about next. We'll talk about Homo erectus.